our next lesson, lesson six in our prophecy series, God's prophetic time clock for Israel. God's prophetic time clock for Israel. And uh, if you do not have a copy of the notes today, would you please raise your hand, Brother Carlos, Brother uh, Derek will come by and get those to you. And this, of course, is a brand new handout from last week. So if you have last week's handout, you're probably going to uh, be looking at it strange in the next few minutes because nothing's going to make sense. The new handout is for today and probably next week as well. Believe it or not, God does have a time clock for the nation of Israel and for that matter for, the, for prophecy in, in general. Most prophecies don't have dates predicting, uh, predicting times of fulfillment. And the prophecy we will learn about, though, is a prophecy with a date on it, or at least with a time uh, on it. You can be sure that when a certain thing happens within a matter of seven years, another certain thing is going to happen. So when I say there's a date on it, that's what I'm talking about. When the confirmation of the covenant happens, and we'll go over what that is again in review, when the confirmation of the covenant happens, it will be seven years until the battle of Armageddon and the final coming of Jesus Christ. So you can take it to the bank that when Israel rebuilds their third temple and animal sacrifices resume, that it's seven years until Armageddon. And it's seven years until the final coming of Jesus Christ. Now this is important. This prophecy is extremely important. Without this understanding, we will be unable to perceive God's time clock for the time in which we live right now. In chapter 5, lesson 5, which we spent several weeks going through, we learned about the history of the nation of Israel and why the land called Israel became the promised land. We learned about Abraham. We learned about the father of the nation of Israel, Abraham, about the God-ordained borders of the promised land. Remember that? We talked about from Egypt, the great river Egypt, all the way to the great river Euphrates. God said to Abraham, this is going to be your land. We discovered from Scripture where God placed His name on the Temple Mount. We understand that that Temple Mount, of course, is Mount Moriah. We also learned about the first temple. The first temple was uh, destroyed in 586 B.C. And Israel's first exile of 70 years began. The second temple, its destruction in 70 A.D. by Titus the Roman Emperor, as well as Israel's second exile of 1878 years. You may remember that that exile ended in 1948 when the United Nations gave Israel back their land. Finally, we learned about the nation of Israel being reborn and that the Temple Mount was reclaimed by Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War. Last week, we ran out of time. I was not able just to touch base with the details of the Six-Day War, but I mentioned to you briefly that in six days, Israel was able to defeat several nations that had risen up against them. And in this, in this great victory that they won, totally outnumbered, outmaneuvered, uh, didn't have the equipment to match these other nations that came against them and how the Lord intervened on their behalf. But in that stunning victory, they reclaimed the Temple Mount area. So now the Temple Mount area is under control of Israel. That's important because that's where they're going to rebuild their temple. Obviously, it makes sense. They can't rebuild the temple in a place they don't have. But if they have it, now the road is clear for them to rebuild their temple. It was a stunning event. Israel defeated all of her enemies in six short days. I'm not surprised by that since the Jews were told by the Lord, take the seventh day as a Sabbath. So even in a time of war, he gave them six days to work and then gave them a day off. Amen. And they won that war in six days. Israel captured the Sinai Desert in the south from Egypt. They captured the Golan Heights in the north from Syria and the biblical area from Judah, Samaria, and Jordan, all the city of Jerusalem. And all of these areas, interestingly enough, are part of the biblical promised land. But the crowning achievement in this six-day war was when they captured Jerusalem. When they, when they got the whole city under their control, including the Temple Mount, where Almighty God said 37 times in the Old Testament, that is where I will put my name. 37 times the Lord said, that is where I will put my name. This is the place where Abraham raised his knife over Isaac. It's the same place where the threshing floor God told David to buy from Aruna was located. This is all the same place. It's where the first temple stood. It's where the second temple stood. And it's going to be where the third temple 
will be rebuilt. So this temple mount, this Mount Moriah, is not just another little piece of real estate that the Jews are fighting over. This means something to them. Amen. They have to have this to fulfill prophecy. Yes. Amen. So now you understand why the Jews are very adamant. They're not giving that away to the Palestinians. Even when the global uh, authorities come and say, look, you just, we could have peace here if you just give a little bit of this away. And they said, we can't give it away. This is where our temple's got to be rebuilt. Amen. This is where God said he'd put his name. 37 times in the Old Testament, I will put my name. That's where he said he would. It's where Abraham was about to offer Isaac. It's where the first temple was. It's where the second temple was. And it's where we're going to rebuild our third temple. So hopefully that puts a little bit into perspective. Now, Yom Kippur is the day of judgment. Everybody say Yom Kippur. Y-O-M is the first word, and Kippur, K-I-P-P-U-R, if you're taking notes, is the second word. This is when the Jewish people believe they are to take inventory of themselves on Rosh Hashanah. They are to repent. They are to fast all day on Yom Kippur, and they are to ask God to forgive their sin. And according to Jewish belief, if they do not repent, God will send judgment. Well, God sent the judgment of the Yom Kippur War and they came awfully close to being totally defeated. The Yom Kippur War. Six years after returning to the Temple Mount, when they could have inherited the blessings of God, if they would have obeyed Him, they turned it over. They did the unthinkable. They turned it over to the Palestinians. It was unbelievable that Israel did that. And God, in His anger, judged the people of Israel on Judgment Day in the Old Testament, which is Yom Kippur. Some of you may know a little bit of the history of this, and so it's just a, a review to kind of get you to the point of where we're at now with Israel. Over time, Israel had sought to make treaties with her Arabian neighbors. And look, folks, we've lost track of how many times different presidents have announced, we think there's going to be a peace deal. We're almost there, right? I mean, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bush 1, Bush 2. They've, they've all, Barack Obama, Trump, right? Biden, every single one of them have said, we're going to try to, uh, we, think, we think there's a, a little glimmer of opportunity here. And it all comes crashing down. It all comes crashing down. Amen. Israel has always, whenever they try to make peace with her Arabian neighbors and they violate the scripture, they bring the judgment of God on them. Look in Exodus 23, 32. Let me read this verse 2. You will put it on the screen there. Exodus 23, 32. God instructed Israel, thou shalt make no covenant with them nor with their gods. Now folks, I don't know how much more clear you can get than that. Get them that. They are not allowed to make covenants with unbelievers and they are not allowed to make covenants with their false gods. Well, what false god do the Arabians worship? They worship Muhammad the prophet, they listen to him and they worship Allah, right? They don't even believe Jesus is the Messiah. So they don't worship the same God and the Jews are not to make any covenant with them. Over time, there have been leaders that have come up in Israel that have chosen to do things their way and God has been watching every choice that Israel has made. He's aware of their failure to live by his word and his instructions. God knows they've been living on their own terms and according to their own intelligence, reasons, and desires. In 1979, let me just give you a little history here. An Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty was formed by U.S. President Jimmy Carter at the Camp David Accords. In 1993, the Oslo Peace Accords were signed on the White House lawn where Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin are pictured shaking hands with each other as President Clinton stood in the background. But if you notice, look at the video on YouTube of that, of that situation. There's a time when President Clinton hands the pen to Yitzhak Rabin and Yitzhak Rabin looks at the pen and he looks at the paper and he pauses. And I believe he was pausing because he knew, I'm about to violate Exodus chapter 23, verse 32. I'm about to make a covenant with people that we are not supposed to make covenants with. And I'm about to worship a God that I'm not allowed to worship. He hesitates. Check it out sometime. It's an amazing thing. You can physically see him pause because I think he is, he is going over it in his mind. The very next year, 1994, the Israeli-Jordanian peace agreement was signed. 
Six years later, President Bill Clinton wanted to continue to make attempts to bring peace to the Middle East. And so Clinton, Ehud Barak, who was the Prime Minister of Israel at the time, Yasser Arafat, the President of the Palestinian Authority, met together for 14 days at Camp David, tried to push it to a final peace agreement. President Clinton tried hard to make it happen, but it just wasn't going to happen. And you remember hearing it over and over and over in the news. There were no smartphones in those days. So every time you turn the radio on, this was what they were talking about. It was in all the papers. It was in Time magazine, Life magazine, and all the magazines. It was all we heard about. And when they came to the issue of the Temple Mount, Yasser Arafat said it was their third holy site, and they were never going to give it up. Ehud Barak said, well, the Palestinians already have your first holy site in Mecca and you have your second holy site in Medina but the Jews we don't even have our first holy site y'all have a holy site already two of them we don't even have our first and we want the temple mount to be our first holy site and the Palestinians would not give it up and so everybody refused to sign President Clinton listen closely offered the solution to share the temple mount which we know is going to be, when that happens, the confirmation of the covenant. And this was a prophetic turn of events that President Clinton even offered that as a solution. The Bible says in the coming peace agreement in the Temple Mount, it will be placed under a sharing authority. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I'll put it on the screen there for you. And there was given unto me a reed like a rod. The angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple or the outside courtyard, leave out. Do not measure that. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot. And look at these next few words. Forty and two months. So there will be a shared agreement for the Temple Mount area for 42 months. So let me stop and say, here is the prophetic timeline. When the temple is rebuilt, from that moment there are seven years before the Battle of Armageddon and the final coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, Three and a half years of that will be relatively peaceful. The Bible says that the Gentiles will trod under their foot in the outer courtyard, the holy city, for 42 months. The unbelievers, not Jews, people that worship Allah, people that believe in uh, the uh, doctrine of Islam, will be able to share part of the Temple Mount era in this shared agreement that world leaders put together. Okay, And you say, well, how long is it going to happen? 42 months. Everybody say three and a half years. Well, this is exactly what President Clinton was offering as a peace solution in the year 2000. This is exactly what he was offering. In 2002, the United States Secretary of State Colin Powell felt Israel and the Palestinians would never be able to forge a peace agreement on their own. So he put together an alliance called the Quartet. You may remember hearing that in the news. Some of the news journalists got, uh, they had a lot of fun with that word and uh, showed four people up with a mic singing in, in harmony. And that's not what the quartet was. The quartet was Russia, the European Union, the United States, and the United Nations. Four superpowers called the quartet. And they were asked by Secretary of State Colin Powell, put together a peace agreement and present it to the Palestinians and the Israelis and tell them, this is what we are telling you to do to have peace. This was called the Roadmap for Peace. So they produced the Roadmap for Peace documents by December 2002, presented it to the Palestinians and Israelis in April 2003, and the whole world put pressure on Israel to sign, put pressure on the Palestinians to sign. They agreed with reservations, but it was unsuccessful. It fell apart. George Bush became president. He felt the need to be a peacemaker. He became the first president to endorse a Palestinian state. Now I want you to remember that. Up to this point, no United States president had endorsed Palestine having a separate state. Every United States president had always said, Israel is the state. The Palestinians are terrorists that are attacking the Israel. But George Bush was the first president to say, we recognize Palestine as a state and you started hearing this term called the two-state solution 
How many has heard that term in the news before? There's going to be a two-state solution. All right. 2007, five years later, during the last two years of his presidency, Bush, in an attempt to bring peace to Israel, convened the Annapolis Peace Conference, but it was too late. Here comes President Obama campaigning for office to succeed President Bush. And one of the things that he said in his campaign was, I'm not going to wait till the last year of my presidency like George Bush and Bill Clinton did. I'm going to bring about Middle East peace right off the bat. And the day Obama was inaugurated, the very day he appointed George Mitchell as a special envoy to the Middle East, after two years of intense efforts, George Mitchell resigned in disgust and said, these people don't want peace. This has been going on for 30, 40, 50 years, folks. It's just, it's just a cycle, right? For the rest of his term, President Obama placed the Israeli-Palestinian issue on the back burner of his administration. When he was elected for his second term, he appointed John Kerry as the Secretary of State. John Kerry, of course, was a presidential candidate that uh, Barack Obama beat out in the primaries. And so Obama tapped into him to be... Secretary of State, John Kerry poured himself in the Middle East with unprecedented zeal. And for nine months, he spent most of his time shuttling between Jerusalem and Ramallah, attempting to bring Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the current Prime Minister of Israel, he was the Prime Minister in those days as well, and Palestinian Chairman Mahmoud Abbas together. In the end, all of these efforts became unraveled. And like him, John Kerry got on a plane, came back to D.C. and said, these people don't want peace. After the disintegration of the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations in 2014, the U.S. State Department issued a warning to Benjamin Netanyahu. This is Obama's administration. They warned Benjamin Netanyahu. You may remember there was a big fluff about this. Netanyahu got on a plane and flew to D.C. and wanted to meet with Obama in the White House. And Obama said... I don't want to meet you. It was the first time in our history a United States president has refused to meet with the Israeli prime minister. They threatened Netanyahu, if you do not move quickly to a two-state solution with the Palestinians, you can assume we are no longer going to protect you at the United Nations. The U.S. has veto power at the United Nations. And what they were doing was threatening Israel and saying, we will allow international law to come after you and sanctions to be put in place if you don't do what we're telling you to do. This is the United States telling Israel this. When President Obama's term ended, rumors circulated that he would get revenge on Netanyahu, especially if Hillary Clinton lost the election. Well, she lost. And on December 23rd, and thank God she lost, on December 23rd, 2016, Resolution 2334 was presented before the UN Security Council. And that resolution stated that Israel's presence in all territories east of the 1967 borders, including East Jerusalem, was a flagrant violation of international law. And the resolution was adopted by every member of the Security Council 14 to 0 with one vote of abstention. And guess who the one vote of abstention was? The United States. If we would have voted no, we could have vetoed the whole thing. But for the first time in history, instead of voting no, President Obama told our special envoy to the UN, don't vote no, just abstain. And so the sanctions went into place against Israel. The passage of this resolution means that Israel is now in violation of international law and can be placed under economic sanctions or even be subjected to military invasion by the international community. So don't let that slip by you. When these sanctions were passed, it became codified in UN law that going forward, listen closely, the UN could put boots on the ground to enforce law against the Jews. Did you catch that? Did everybody catch that? What that is doing is setting up for the Battle of Armageddon. When the UN forces with their blue helmets are helicoptered in and land in Jerusalem and they say, we have authority to be here because 14 to 0, it was, it was chosen that you would be sanctioned and you are in violation of international law for being in these certain areas. We've asked you to pull your uh, people out and you won't, so now we're going to make you. And that will be the beginning of the actual battle of Armageddon. And the law has already been passed. 14 to 0. Look at your neighbor and say it's about to happen. 
I think it's likely that the government, international government, world government, is going to use Resolution 2334, and they will invade Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. Donald Trump, after winning the presidency, said he would attempt to do the deal, quote, that can't be done. And that's so typical of him. He can't just say it flat out. He talks in these weird terms. I'm going to do the deal that can't be done. What he was saying was, I'm going to make happen what no other president has been able to accomplish. And so, you know what happened. He was serious about negotiating a deal between the Palestinians and Israelis. Immediately after his inauguration, he appointed two of his closest aides, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, who is a Jew. He sent him, Jared, go to Israel. Let's try to work out a peace deal. And Jason Greenblatt, a personal attorney of Trump's for 20 years, they led the efforts to achieve a Middle East peace deal. They launched their efforts within one week of Donald Trump being sworn in as president. They worked quietly, but they worked constantly for the first 10 months of Trump's presidency, meeting with Netanyahu, meeting with Mahmoud Abbas and other Arab Arabian leaders. In the first seven months alone, they met with the Palestinian leader over 20 times trying to get this peace deal signed. Don't you know President Trump would have loved to have said, I'm the only president that got the Israelis and the Palestinians to agree to something. A president's first foreign trip after taking office usually indicates where his priorities are going to be during his presidency. And there were a lot of pundits that were surprised when it was announced that President Trump's first foreign trip was to Saudi Arabia. Listen, as events unfolded, it became clear Trump was going to try a regional solution. May 21st, 2017, the president spoke to leaders of 50 Muslim-majority countries. He boldly challenged them, eradicate terror, and join the U.S. in vanquishing all terror, and in the, his words, those that worship death instead of life. Well, that's Muslim extremists who constantly are killing themselves, blowing themselves up. President Trump promised to stand with the Arabian nations against the world's number one supporter of terrorism, Iran. So Trump went in, got all the Arabian nations together and said, let's all team up against Iran because Iran is sponsoring terror. And as you know, Iran is sponsoring the people that invaded Israel on October the 7th of this year. Hamas is sponsored by Iran. Hezbollah is sponsored by Iran. The Houthis are sponsored by Iran. We just sank three, uh, two or three of their ships here in the last few days. I mean, uh, Iran is the number one terror, uh, a sponsor of, of state terrorism. And here is President Trump saying to the Arabians, let's gang up against them. And if we can defeat terrorism, maybe we can get some peace going over in Jerusalem. President Trump was given a royal welcome. Saudi's King Salman presented Trump with the kingdom's highest civilian honor during a meeting at the royal court in the Saudi capital, Riyadh. As Trump continued to win friends among the Arabians, it became apparent he was not going to ask the Palestinians to make peace with the Jews. He was going to get Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Qatar, Jordan, Amman, Egypt, and others to join with the Palestinians in making peace with Israel. And along with these regional efforts throughout his presidency, President Trump made several efforts to end the stalled Israeli-Palestinian conflict, all the while acknowledging Israel's right to the promised land. And then something amazing happened on December the 6th of 2017. This was quietly announced. The, the liberal news media didn't put a lot of emphasis on this, but people that study prophecy sat up and paid attention. President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. December the 6th, 2017. Do you know that had been passed about 50 years earlier? But no president had the gumption to do it because they were afraid of what the Muslim nations would say. They were afraid Saudi Arabia would cut our oil off. They were afraid Iran would create more terrorism. But Trump is the first president that said, bless God, this is the law. Israel is the only nation on the planet with two capital cities. Jerusalem, the eternal capital from the Old Testament, right? And then Tel Aviv, the capital that the UN told them was going to be their capital. The Jews don't recognize Tel Aviv as their capital. They, re they recognize Jerusalem as their capital. Amen. Amen? The main airport is Tel Aviv. 
because that's where the international community told them to put it. But the Jews, you ask them, what is the capital city of, of Israel? And they're going to say, Jerusalem is the eternal capital. And President Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He also recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights up north in Syria. In January 28th of 2020, President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu unveiled what he called the deal of the century for a two-state peace plan between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And if the deal would have been agreed to, Israel would have annexed 30% of the West Bank, leaving 70% to the Palestinians to create a brand new Palestinian state. And for some, it was this provision that led to the Abraham Accords. On September the 15th, 2020, representatives from Israel, the United States, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain met in D.C. on the White House lawn, and there they signed what they called, and listen folks, words mean things, they called this the Abraham Accords. Why did they call it the Abraham Accords? Because Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. Amen. We all know that. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right, when he wrestled with the angel. But who else did Abraham father? Ishmael. Remember with Hagar, his maid? Yeah. You remember when Sarah said, how am I going to have a child? I got this good-looking little handmaid. Go in there and have a baby with her. and Let's get this show on the road. And Abraham said, okay, and went in, and they had a baby, and they called his name Ishmael. And Ishmael is the father of the Arabian people. That's right. And so when all these nations got together, and they said, we've got to have peace. Man, what is the common denominator here? <laughs> there really is none. The Jews worship the one true God, Yahweh, and the Muslims worship Allah. The Jews say that there are many prophets that all uh, spoke the word of the one true God, Yahweh. And the Muslims say Muhammad is the holy prophet and, and, and he should be listened to. And the, the, the Jews worship the Torah, uh, listen to the Torah and read the holy scriptures uh, from the prophets. And, and, and the Muslims read the Quran. And man, there is no common denominator. And somebody said, yes, there is. They both have the same daddy. Let's call it the Abraham Accords. And this veiled attempt to bring these two people to the table. This agreement normalized relations between Israel and all of these Arabian countries. And months later, Yusef Otaba, the United Emirates ambassador to the U.S., said the normalization agreement, the Abraham Accords, were primarily about preventing annexation and only time will tell if it will lead to a resolution. And I stand here today, two and a half months after October the 7th, and I tell you, it's pretty apparent it did not lead to a peaceful resolution. Within just three years, it broke down. Now, so I leave you with this question, and I have some scripture I want to share. Turn to Daniel 9, 24, and I've been giving you some details because I'm leading up to this point. Daniel 9, 24, and we're going to read down through verse number 27. All right, so we've set the stage for what I'm about to tell you. The question is, will there be peace in the Middle East. Will there ever be peace? I'm 51. I'll be 52 in a little bit, a couple months. And listen, folks, I've heard this all my life. We're almost on the verge of a deal. We're almost there. And it always falls through. One of the greatest prophecies of all foretold is the Messiah would come to the earth. That was one of the greatest prophecies. And it would prove the identity of the Messiah. One of the greatest prophecies ever foretold was the crucifixion of the Messiah. And the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple. One of the greatest prophecies ever told is that this event will trigger the final seven years to Armageddon. You say, Pastor, you're talking about multiple prophecies. No, I'm talking about one passage of scripture that I'm going to share with you that prophesies all of this at the same time. This prophecy provides clues to the identity of the Antichrist and establishes the seven-year timeline for end-time events. How soon will the final seven years begin? Well, the stage is set right now. And I believe that with what happened two and a half months ago, right about the time I started teaching this lesson, we have been launched into the time that this is happening. Let's read Daniel 9.24. Now, this is, this is dense, folks. You've got to really pay attention to this. 
uh, and I'll go back and, and, and explain it as, as much as possible, but I really need you to focus on this. Daniel 9 and 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Everybody say Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The people of the Jews. So here's Daniel. This is what we call the 70-week vision. And Daniel is saying, 70 weeks are determined upon the Jews and Jerusalem to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Well, who's the most holy? Jesus. So 70 weeks. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand. So real quick. Don't let your eyes cross when we get into complicated prophecy and say, oh my God, Pastor, I, I, I. the Bible says you need to know and you need to understand. Yes. That's why we stop and teach it. You need to know and you need to understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. Ah, From the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks. Everybody say seven. seven. So if we start off with 70 and you minus seven, we now need 63 more weeks to account for. Well, look at this. And three score and two weeks. Well, what is a score? 20. What is three times 20? 60. 62. Are you with me? Let's do the math. We're starting off with 70 weeks. The Bible's, we're going to talk about seven of those weeks, so minus seven. That's one time period. Now we have 63 weeks left that we need to discuss. Minus out 62 of those, there's another time period. That leaves us with one little segment left that is one week. Is everybody with me on that? Amen. Start off with 70, minus seven, minus 62 equals one. Is everybody on the same page? I know math is hard early on in the morning. Just pretend you're in school. Okay, you are in school. You're in Sunday school. Amen. Look at this. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So something's going to be built again and the wall in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, so after the 69 uh, the 62 weeks plus the seven that had already elapsed, that's 69, shall Messiah be cut off. Oh. Was the Messiah cut off? Was Jesus crucified? Was he put in the grave? Did he resurrect? Okay, the Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. All right, you remember the term abomination of desolation. Remember that. Verse 27. And he, the Antichrist, the Bible calls him also the prince in verse number 26. That's a lowercase p, prince. He's not the prince of peace. In juxtaposition to that, look in verse 25. The Messiah is referred to as the capital P, prince. So Jesus is the capital P, prince. The Antichrist is the lowercase p, prince. Is everybody following me? Amen. Let's keep reading. The Antichrist shall confirm the covenant, verse 27, the covenant shall be confirmed. What is the covenant that we've been talking about that's going to be confirmed? It's this idea that the Jews are going to have to share the outer courtyard with the Gentiles on the Temple Mount. All right, verse 27. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice, the oblation to cease, for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Verse 27, Jesus quotes that verse in Matthew and calls it the abomination of desolation. That's right. Paul quotes it in his epistles and calls it the abomination of desolation. They are both referring to Daniel 9, 27. Amen. This is just review because we've gone over this ad nauseum. What is an abomination? Something God hates. What is a desolation? Something that is destructive. Something that means was destroyed. So something is going to happen that God hates that's going to cause destruction. Okay? All right. Now, this one prophecy, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, this one prophecy in one portion of Scripture, just several verses, 
covers from when the Messiah comes to the earth to when he's crucified, the church age, and then the final seven years. And it speaks of it in the word called a week. Okay? The prophecy foretells a peace agreement that will be reached between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And when it is concluded, verse 26 and 27 says, it will trigger a seven-year period called a week. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. It's going to culminate at the Battle of Armageddon and the final coming of Jesus to the earth. Now, some of these provisions in this agreement are going to be a Palestinian state will be created in Judea, commonly referred to as the West Bank. Jews that are presently living in the area of the new Palestinian state will probably be permitted to stay living as Jews in a minority situation under Palestinian government. The Temple Mount is going to be placed under a shared agreement between Jews and Muslims. Israel is going to be allowed to build its third temple, but it will not disturb the Dome of the Rock or the al Asqa Mosque. The international community will supervise this shared arrangement. Negotiations concerning the status of Jerusalem will reach an impasse. A final agreement on this issue will be postponed for seven years with the understanding it will be dealt with at that time. And in the interim, Israel will retain control over all of Jerusalem. The Jewish temple will be completed. And at the three and a half year mark, the Antichrist walks in and says, no longer necessary to worship the Messiah because I'm the Messiah. Stop all sacrifices. I'm here. And that's why he's called the Antichrist. Somebody say amen. amen. Think about that. When the Jews complete their temple, they will start offering animal sacrifices. Think about that. Think about the ramifications that's going to have in the international community when the Jews are live streaming the killing of lambs on an altar. And the killing of bullocks on an altar. You say, oh my God, Pastor, I'm vegan. I... Hey, that's Old Testament. That's what they did. Amen. And they're going to be live streaming that because the Jews literally believe we have to get back to offering sacrifices so the Messiah comes. And we got a long time to make up for. Yeah. Amen? Amen. I, I don't know if I'd be comfortable watching a, a, a lamb led up to the altar and it's throat cut and blood spewing out and, and kicking and squirming and flames going up. I, that's not something I'm looking forward to watching, but I understand that that's what the Bible in the Old Testament said the Jews had to do. Amen. And they believe this. And they're going to resume this. And how long do you think that's going to go on before there's protesters out? Stop killing innocent animals. You know. Evil, evil, evil. Right? There's going to be an international outcry against the Jewish people for them to stop this. Think about that for a moment. I'm not trying to be insensitive here, but the animal rights activists will be incensed by what they view as barbaric religious practices that have no place in the modern world. I can see placards. Animals have rights too. Yeah. And, and, and understand, listen, I... I don't, I'm not cruel to animals. I love animals. But I could see the international community saying, Barbarism in the 21st century. Since the international community was given the responsibility of supervising the Temple Mount, pressure is going to be put on it to stop animal sacrifices. And by this time, a charismatic world politician will have gained recognition as the international community leader. And since he will have participated in the peace agreement that allowed for the building of the third temple, speculation will be circulating. Perhaps he is the Messiah. And the pressure to resolve this will be on his shoulders. That world leader we know of is the Antichrist. And he will order the sacrifices stopped. He will explain they're not needed anymore since he is the Messiah. And he will make this declaration from the Temple Mount, which is where God said 37 times in the Old Testament, I'm going to put my name. Which is where Abraham raised his dagger to kill Isaac and God stopped him. Which is where the first temple was built by Solomon. Which is where the second temple was built and destroyed. And it is now where the third temple. This is where this, the Bible says, man of sin, son of perdition will stand and say, I am the Messiah. And I ask this audience this question. 
What happened last time somebody rose up against God and said, I will be as God. I will be like the Most High. What happened there? God kicked him out. God said, I'll show you who's God. You and all your imps can go with you. And kicked him out of heaven. And for years, the enemy and his imps have had a footprint on their rear end, walking around, kind of bruised a little bit because they got evicted out of heaven. God said, you're not going to rise up against me and tell me you're God. I'm God. Amen. There's only one God. Amen. And when the Antichrist does it, it will be Satan's second attempt to rise up against God. And God's going to deal with it like he dealt with it back in the back, in the Old Testament. Yeah. And it's called the abomination of desolation. This event... The abomination of desolation will trigger an outbreak of violence by the Palestinians against those Jews who remained in the newly formed Palestinian state. And Jesus calls this outbreak of violence the Great Tribulation. And Jesus warns them in the book of Matthew, you need to flee to the mountains. Don't look back. Don't take anything with you. Flee. What Jesus is saying to the Jews is, get out of that area because the Palestinians are going to slaughter you. The Antichrist will then begin to persecute everybody on the earth who will not pledge allegiance to his emerging world government system. And this time is called the Great Tribulation and it will last for three and a half years. There's a seven year period. Everybody with me? Yeah. Temple gets rebuilt. And that could happen. That could start happening any time. Three and a half years go by. The Jews are resuming animal sacrifices. Everything's kind of peaceful. Jerusalem is put under an international peace deal where the international community is monitoring what's going on. The Arabians are able to go to the outer courtyard of the Temple Mount, but they can't go in. And the Jews are not to destroy, uh, destroy or bother the Dome of the Rock. This will be the beginning of the seven years. The Bible calls that the confirmation of the covenant. Is everybody with me? We're, we're, we're getting a, a familiar handle on these terms. Halfway into that seven years, 42 months, the Bible says, is the abomination of desolation. When the Antichrist walks in and says, hop, halt everything, I'm the Messiah. And that starts the great tribulation. Three and a half years after that is when the battle of Armageddon happens. You say, Pastor, where will the church be? Oh, great question. Guess who comes back with Christ? To rescue the Jews at the battle of Armageddon. The raptured saints. Which means we will not have been here during that time. Because we will be with him. Amen. Boy, isn't that a good feeling? You say, well, why are we having this Bible study? So you can go out and explain this to other people who are not ready. Amen. I don't think we should just come to church and get the Holy Ghost and say, Whew, man, I got my ticket out of here. I don't care if anybody else knows. I'm going to keep it quiet. You need to get an understanding of this so you can tell people, hey, you don't want to be here when this happens. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Let me tell you how it's going to go down. Let everybody you know know about this. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. The abomination of desolation is the midway point. When the seven-year term of the peace agreement expires, the Palestinians and the international community will demand, using United Nations Security Council Resolution 2334 and others, that Israel surrender East Jerusalem to become the capital of the Palestinian state. Israel will say no, not surprisingly. And the international community, flying a UN blue flag, will then invade Israel to force compliance. Israel will fight against the invading armies of the Antichrist and the world government. And the Bible calls this the Battle of Armageddon. Israel will fall back under the superior firepower of all the international community. Finally, Israel will make its last stand at its eternal capital, Jerusalem. Half of Jerusalem will fall to the UN. It will appear Israel is on the verge of being wiped out. And it is at this time that the Messiah comes back. The raptured saints come with him. The Messiah touches his feet down on the Mount of Olives. And the Jews who are still alive rush to him and say, Finally our Messiah. And then they say, What do these nail prints mean in your hands and in your feet? And it dawns on them that their Messiah is none other than Jesus Christ. Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, Jesus will defeat the world government. He'll remove all human governments. He'll establish the millennium, which is the 1,000-year reign. 
It's one thing to assert all these things are going to happen, but how can we prove it? I'm going to leave you hanging here a little bit. Next week, we're going to go back to Daniel 9, 24 through 27, and I'm going to break down those three time segments. The seven-week period, the 62-week period, and the final one-week period, which total 70 weeks. I'm going to break those down and go over them, and it's going to blow your mind how accurate the Scripture is. Somebody say amen. amen. Keep your hand out. We did make some extra copies, but keep it so you can bring it next week and uh, fill in the blanks. And when we get done, of course, we'll go through, as we always do, and give you all the answers to all the questions. So some of you like to follow and write as you go. Some of you, it aggravates you to have to be waiting with bated breath, and I understand that. There are different ways of learning. If you don't want to be waiting for every word, that's fine. You can wait to the end. If you, if you learn better by just listening and soaking it all up, that's fine. At the end, we'll give you all the answers. Amen? Let's stand together. Praise God. God bless you. We're going to have a great day today. Amen. I believe God's going to help us end this year on a high note, start the new year on a high note. Let's lift our hands and receive His Word. Father, we thank You for Your presence today. Thank You for Your Spirit. Thank you for allowing us to learn from the Word of God very interesting events that are developing right before our very eyes. And we want to be ready to meet you, Lord. We want to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we know that to hear you say that, we have to be ready to be caught up in the rapture, which literally could happen any moment, any minute, any second. We want to be ready. Bless us today. Let us have a great service. Let the presence of God be in this place in a powerful way. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. May the Lord go with you. Let's have a brief.